Good afternoon. It is certainly good to be together here in this way. And uh, I want to greet each and every one in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Can you hear me properly? Yeah, you're good? Okay, I'll take this out of the way. That, you, that way you can see my knees wobble a little bit better. All right. So uh, it, uh, it has been a blessing for us as a family to be part of uh, bits and pieces of this weekend. Unfortunately, a few of our children are not feeling well, and so uh, we've had to enjoy it from home. And uh, so I just want to thank you all for making this possible. I want to express my appreciation for those who've spent a lot of time and effort into making a weekend like this possible and making it happen. There are so many things that go on behind the scenes that, that uh, someone has to do them, and you did them. I also want to especially thank the ones that decorated this, this platform last night as uh, we tuned into the first session. I was really impressed with the visual and especially with the verse that is uh, here. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's found in Joshua 24, back in the summer of 2005, when Eggy and myself uh, got married, we decided during our time of preparation for the wedding, for our marriage, for our home, that we would claim that verse as our uh, family model. And uh, so that verse, we always notice it right away when it is somewhere. Ah, there's our, our family verse. It is, it's found uh, like in, in Joshua 24 at a time when Joshua appeals to the Israelites. And uh, he appeals them and asks them to make a personal decision to serve the Lord. He presents uh, all the things that God has done for them uh, over the or previous years. And he also presents to them the other gods, little g, that they have encountered as they battled with other nations, as they encountered other nations. And at the end, at the end of it, he says, now the choice is yours. Choose ye this day whom you will serve, whether it's going to be the God of the Israelites, the true God, or if it's going to be the, the gods of other nations. And he says, at the end of that verse, he says, but as for me and my house, we're choosing the Lord. We're choosing team God. We're choosing the God of Israel, and I pray that whether you are single, married, or you have children, without children, young or old, that that is the choice that you have made as well. I'm on team God. I'm with God. I'm choosing the God of the Israelites. And it is that type of choice, that type of commitment that influences the decisions, the daily decisions you make. The, the long-term decisions that you make. How is this going to impact my commitment to God? For this afternoon, we want to look at a little bit at the uh, topic of family devotions. And if you are like me, uh, when you hear the word family devotions, uh, sometimes it might trigger a picture in your mind of a dad and a mom sitting together with a number of children together, and uh, everyone is sitting prim and proper, and uh, the Bible is there, and it's just looking like uh, a feast is happening right here. Now, if we're being totally honest uh, with our families, especially with those of us that have smaller children, that picture-perfect devotional time is, can be rare. It's not, uh, we have five children, and uh, uh, it isn't every day that everyone is sitting quietly, perfectly quiet, attentively. That is not necessarily the normal experience. However, that does not mean that the time together is wasted. And so, if we compare the ideal we sometimes have in our minds of what family devotions are with what we experience, there might be room for discouragement and maybe even thoughts of, is it really worth it? 
is it making a difference in my family if I lead out as the dad? Maybe sometimes we felt like giving up or we are in the state right now where we have given up, just not worth the frustration. Maybe you're a new family, um, or I should say maybe you're a family that's new to the Christian faith, and you're looking for ideas on what, how can we pass on this faith to the next generation, and where, wherever you find yourself at. Maybe your family devotions are going really good right now. I pray that the next 30 minutes or so it will be a blessing for each one of us. I'd like to begin by asking a question. There are, in my mind, there are two ways that we spread the message of the kingdom. How, what are those two ways? I'd like to hear from you. Example? Example? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm looking for a very common word. What's, what's a way that you spread the message of the kingdom? Preaching. Preaching. And starts with an M. Missions, right? Uh, we often look, look at missions as being the only way that the preaching, that the expansion of the kingdom happens. But I want to suggest to you this afternoon that there is a second way. Who wants to guess what the second way is? Praying. 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 Think. Family. Family. More specifically, raising a godly family. I think that's the two ways that God has designed for his message, the gospel message, to spread. It's through missions, and, and the story of Scripture is full of, uh, that's what God's heart is, that his uh, gospel message would be preached to each and every one. Now, there's two ways we can do that. First one is through missions. And thanks be to God that someone in previous generations brought the gospel message to the Duicks, the Cornells, and the Platts. Someone did it. But thanks be to God that, for the most part, a lot of us had parents that taught us the way of Jesus, and it didn't come through a foreign missionary. So I want to suggest to you that there are two ways that we as people spread the gospel message through our godly families, through missions. Someone has said that God does not have grandchildren. Have you ever thought about that? Your faith, your spouse's faith, or your sibling's faith is not enough for your children. Association to someone's strong faith within your family does not qualify in the eyes of God. Each Christian's faith has to be personal. Each child of God is a child. They're not a grandchild. Just because your parent uh, was a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. No, God does not have grandchildren. He only has children. And that, what a blessing to have. And so there, really in a nutshell, you have the fundamental reasons to have family devotions. You are part of of building the future of the church. And so, this, for the next 30 minutes, let's think of family devotions a little bit broader. Think of it as passing the truths of God to the next generation. Whether that is, we want to specifically focus on our family, but that's what it is. It's passing the truths of God to the next generation. And, and to do that, let's look at three questions in regards to family devotions. Why? Why do we or should we have them? The second question, what is the purpose for them? And the third question, how? Basically, some practical ideas. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you or someone close to you does, please turn to the Joshua chapter 4. Here we have... An entire chapter in the Bible centered around the theme of family devotion. So if you're wondering today, are devotions important? Let me suggest to you, if God thought it important enough to dedicate an, a, a chapter in the Bible to, to this subject, that it, he deems it very important. 
the story, the context of the story is um, the Israelites are ready to enter into their promised land. They've been traveling in the wilderness for 40 years, and uh, just before they are ready to cross the Jordan into the promised land, uh, Moses has passed away, and Joshua has been installed as the new leader. According to the previous chapter, chapter 3 of of Joshua, the, the Jordan is overflowing at its banks, meaning that this is not dry season. We're not talking about a time in the, in the river of Jordan's uh, seasonal ups and downs. It's not dry season here. It's not just a few inches uh, of water. This is it's overflowing at the banks. It's, the Jordan is at its strongest and its fullest. And so I would like for us to begin reading in this chapter we will uh, we'll read the first 10, 11 verses. We'll skip some then, and then we'll uh, finish, uh, toward, uh, read the rest of the chapter towards the end. So if you have uh, your Bibles, uh, turn to Joshua chapter 4. I'll start reading in verse 1. And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men, from the people, one man from every tribe, and commanded them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? So here we have the reason for the stones. It's supposed to trigger questions in the children's lives. Then verse 7. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. Now Joshua also set up twelve stones uh, in the middle of the Jordan, a landmark that would correspond with the twelve stones that these twelve men were bringing, and they would put them up at Gilgal. So the priests who bore the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people, according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed over. Then we'll skip 11 through through 19. Let's start again in verse 20. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Again, I want us to remember as we read through this this chapter, the stones are put up to elicit, to trigger, to cause children to ask questions, and as a result, give the parents an opportunity to teach their children about God. Then verse 22, then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever." The ultimate purpose is that everyone may know God. So why should we have family devotions? Because God commands it. Very simplistic. 
but true. Scripture is full of commands for parents to be teachers of the ways of God to their children. We certainly are blessed to have a good church. We certainly are good blessed. We are blessed to have a good Sunday school. We are blessed to have an excellent day school. I spent some time with with the principal this last week and and uh, uh, praying with him, and I was just so blessed for his heart for the for the school and. We are blessed when we think about this church, the school, the Sunday school that we have. But all of these good things, blessings from the Lord, do not absolve us as parents from our responsibility to teach our own children. Rather, they are there. These good things are there to augment or to strengthen what you already are teaching your children at home. As this last year has shown, or the last two years, school, church, Sunday school can quite suddenly be taken from you. And I pray that our family devotions are such that our family doesn't necessarily have to suffer spiritually that much. Although it is so good to be together, we need the fellowship of other believers. And yet, if there's strong family devotions, strong time in the Word, strong teaching about God... It can uh, lessen the impact of being separated from uh, a a church circle for a while. I'd like to just look at a few more scriptures here on why, on the command, on God's commands to to teach our children. In Deuteronomy 4, 9 to 11, it says, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren. And then in verse 10 it says, Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. Now we are not, don't have enough time, but in, in a lot of these instances where, where God commends or says that, Uh, that we are to teach our children, there's a specific part uh, or a specific attribute of God that is coming out in those those verses. And we don't have time to look at uh, all of that today. But I just want to look at the overall theme. God is concerned that uh, the things he does for you as the believer will not be forgotten and uh, with you. It's supposed to be passed on to your children In Deuteronomy 6, 7 to 10, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statues, and the judgments with which the Lord our God has commanded you? Now, if you read through um, Leviticus, it's full of statues and testimonies and judgments. And when the time comes that your son asks you why, why is this important? Then you shall say to your son, We once were slaves, or we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh and all his household. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he had swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statues, to fear the Lord our God, I want us to notice this, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. That it will, then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Now when we teach scripture, there is do's and don'ts in scripture. And sometimes our, our, our children will ask, why can we not do this? Or why do we not do this? And when we think about the book of Leviticus and all the rules and regulations that were there, God's concern was that it wouldn't get a negative spin to it. No, in verse 24 he says, And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good. He meant it for good, he, that he could preserve them as alive in his day. And so the, 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 the restrictions... Sometimes uh, uh, some people claim that the, the Christian life is too restrictive. It not necessarily, isn't re- necessarily restrictive. The, the, the restrictions that are there are there for our own good. 
and if we can pass that on. The restrictions that are there, they are for our own good to keep us alive in the Christian faith. It will make a difference in the children that we teach. And then the last verse I, I chose for this, uh, just why, why should we have devotions, is found in Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Very clear commands in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that we are responsible to teach the children about God, to pass on the faith that is within us, the reason of the faith that is within us. Second question I wanted to look at is, what is the purpose for devotions? I'll suggest to you the purpose is to teach the children that there is a God. He is alive. He is the creator of all things. He is among us. He is not only alive and the creator of all things, he's not only among us in a plural form, but he lives in our hearts and he lives in our family and we invite him into our family. That's where we want him to be and that he is part of our daily, I mean, I'm talking about God, that God is part of our daily experience. In Joshua 3, the previous chapter um, uh, from our text, it says, uh, in, prep, as, in preparation, as, as Joshua is getting ready to cross the Jordan, in verse, three, uh, in verse 10 it says, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you, and then they na uh, names a list of people, the enemies. So part of the purpose for having devotions is to teach our children that there is a God. He is among us. He is alive, and he cares about us, and he is part of our daily experience. One of... Uh, the fondest memories I have as far as God being part of uh, the family that I grew up in and in, in the daily experience there was, uh, oh man, it's many, many years ago. We were still living in Mexico, so this would have been pre-1995. And then, uh, so that's a long time ago for a lot of you. But uh, I'm guessing I was somewhere in the age of 8 to 10 years old. And... Uh, and my dad had bought um, uh, a pickup truck. He, he, had, uh, he was driving an old Ford pickup truck, and he, he thought it was time for a different one. And so he had met uh, uh, someone that was trying to sell a, a pickup truck, someone he didn't know, someone that lived somewhere else, and he had given uh, a down payment on this pickup truck with the agreement that in three or four days, I can't remember, um, this, the, the man would deliver that pickup truck. And, uh, and so uh, we grew up uh, during that time as being quite poor. Uh, we didn't necessarily have a whole lot of extra money, and so a deposit of just a few hundred dollars at that point in time um, was a lot of money in, in, in for my dad and for our family. And uh, as as the days went by, uh, day three passed, day four passed, day five passed, my dad was getting really worried. He had made this agreement with this man that the truck would come, but it didn't come. And so was he now going to lose not only the, the truck that he had thought he had bought, but secondly, uh, the money, the deposit that he had left. And I remember as, uh, as a young child observing and partially being part of the, the stress that my parents were going through. And a lot of time was spent praying. And I remember uh, specifically that I went in the middle of the day, I went into the barn for a certain reason, and I found my dad there, and he was praying. And that left an impact on me, uh, that my dad invited God into his very real experience when it came to buying a pickup truck. Fortunately, the truck uh, did come eventually. It was just a little late. It all worked out in the end. Or I remember in 1995 when, uh, when we made the move to Canada and uh, I, was, I was 12, 13 years old at that point in time 
and just overhearing my parents talk about how they had prayed about this decision and how they now felt so at total peace about the direction that, that God was leading them as a family to, to make the move to Canada. And so these are two memories that I have. They don't necessarily center around a Bible reading time at the, uh, at the breakfast table or at the supper table or just before nighttime, but they've, they were very are imprinted on my mind as very clear experiences where my mom or my dad went through something, God was involved, and God helped. God was there. And I, I think I can testify um, that as a family um, we have often done this. We have involved our children in, in times of, of, of sorrow and times of great joy, um, invited God to be part of this, invited our children to be part of our experience at that point in time. Obviously, it has to be age appropriate, depending on the age of your children. But pass on to your children that God is alive. He's not just a distant God that rose and and spends his time being busy in heaven. No, he is involved in the believer's lives on a day-to-day basis. So what is the first purpose of having devotions? To teach the children that there is a God who is among us, he is alive, and he's part of our daily experience. The second reason is to pass on the faith. 2 Timothy 1.5, we have Paul, who, who says to uh, who writes in, in, in 2 Timothy about Timothy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Part of family devotions, part of inviting God into your daily life as a family is to pass on the faith, to pass on that strong faith that exists in you which we've been given by God, according to Ephesians, but so that the children have a model to follow. Third reason that we have family devotions is to bring the family together. The older your children are, uh, the more difficult it is to find quality family time. And a specific time of devotions, a specific time of prayer, uh, is a way that you can consistently have time together as a family, to bring yourselves together and to build relationships with your children. It is almost always uh, times when when we feel like, um, you know, it's getting a little late. We have our family devotions in the evening just before we we go to bed. And so often uh, it, it would make sense to skip it. It's just getting too late. But We've com- we're committed to this. We need to have some time together with our children. Um, and so often, it's when we have this, this uninterrupted time together that we can interact with our children and, uh, and see where their hearts are really at, answer some questions, and pray with them. And the last reason that I have marked down the ultimate purpose is that everyone, all the peoples of the earth, may know God. May know God. We find this, as I mentioned already in Joshua 4.24, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. God is inviting us and our children to be part of his bigger story. The overarching story of Scripture is that God created mankind, scattered them all over the earth, and is bringing mankind from every tribe, every language, every culture back together through his son Jesus for the glory of God into his eternal existence with him. That's the overarching story of the theme of the Bible. If if you could just nail it down to one, is this, that God created mankind, scattered them all over the place, and is bringing them together from every tribe, nation, culture, tongue, through his son Jesus Christ, so that At some point in time in the future, we will spend eternity with him. And every tongue, nation, uh, will be represented around the throne of heaven. So that's another reason why we have family devotions. 
Now quickly, we're running out of time here. Um, the how, some practical ideas. Back in our text, um, we'll, we'll call it the stones of memorial. God was concerned that there would be stones of memorial that would be put in an, I ass, I'm assuming, at an odd place. This would, not, this would not be just a rock pile among other rock piles. No, this rock pile would be at such a place that it would cause questions to be asked. It is easy to forget what all, what all the good blessings is, uh, are that God is doing for you and me. And God is aware of this and how easy it is for us as his believe, uh, followers to forget. And so he's giving us, he's giving the Israelites in this story an example or a, a way, a method that the story of him helping the Israelites for those years, bringing them out of Egypt, can be uh, kept alive. I know a family um, that diligently writes down their God stories. Times when they face difficulty, times when they have uh, faced some extraordinary circumstance, they, they write it down, put a few pictures uh, together, maybe on a, just on a, a little bit of a worksheet, and they print it out and they uh, put it in a binder. And they have this binder in their living room, on their coffee table. And so when their children um, uh, lounge around on the couches, and as children often do, they pick up books, whatever they want to, and they read. They read about the ways God has helped that specific family. Part of the Old Testament rituals were that they were to remind the Israelites. I, I'm thinking about uh, Exodus 13.8. is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And at the end of that, it, it, it says, uh, when your son asks you why we are doing this, then it's an, another opportunity to teach about the living God that is among you. And that just kind of stuck out to me. I'm, I have a 14-year-old son at home right now. And... Uh, he eats a lot of food. He's in that stage where he eats a lot of food. And if I would significantly change his diet for seven days, um, it would cause questions. Uh, why, why is this going on? And so God, uh, is, it sounds like one of the reasons he introduced the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is it would cause questions about the sons. They would ask, why do we do this? And it was an opportunity for the father to share why we do this. Same thing that applies in Exodus 12 to about the, the Passover. Obviously, there's a greater meaning to the Passover, but some of the rituals that were involved in there, God says, when your children ask, here's your opportunity to tell them. So what are some ways for us as families um, to do this? Um, for us as a family, we don't have that book like I shared with, with, with one family uh, we have meaningful decorative items in our, um, in our house. Uh, decorative item, uh, items with sayings that are attached to a story, an experience that we as a family went through. I don't know what, that, what it is for your family, but uh, as parents, it takes a certain amount of creativity to come up with stones of memorial, memories of stories in your family's history whether it's a long history or a short history that reminds everyone of how God helped in that specific situation. Other ways that we can bring uh, awareness about God being part of our lives and into our, uh, into our family is, I don't know if, if, if your children are like mine, but very often I will hear the phrase, Daddy, can you tell a little boy story? It's a story about my growing up years and involving God in those stories are wonderful opportunities for you to share about um, God. At the supper table, as you interact with one another and uh, you ask uh, how each one's day was, try to bring God into the conversation. This and this is what I went through. This and this I, I did today, and God was there. Maybe you're just going through your day and, and, uh, and you, uh, yeah, you're thinking about your family and uh, 
You'd like for them to be strong believers, kind and patient believers in times of difficulty. Um, display that in your day-to-day -day walk with God. Teach them what it means to, to be kind and gentle in stressful situations by being an example, by living it. I'm going to have to skip here a, a number of, of notes here. Uh, some, so these are just like uh, stones of memorial, things that we can do to, to cause questions in our children's lives, that, to, to provide us with an opportunity to give, uh, uh, to, to provide us with an opportunity to teach them about God. And then obviously, and I do not want to minimize this, there is teaching the Bible, having uh, a time together where we, we look at God's Word. And it depends a little bit on the age of your children. Um, we found this really wonderful book. Uh, it has simplified Bible stories in it that uh, it's 316 to 312 stories uh, from the Bible, taken from the Bible. And we just read one story a day. And then uh, at the end, there's a, a guide, uh, a questions guide. And these are, these are it's simplified stories, something that, that will appeal to your younger children. Uh, and, and they're simple questions that you can ask. Uh, and it involves them in, uh, in the story. That's something we've found to be very meaningful. The last year or two, we have uh, tried to expose our children not only to God's word, but also to, to uh, missionary heroes. And I, I know Edward sells these in his, in his bookstore. We have a whole uh, shelf full of these. It's called the Christian Heroes Then and Now. Wonderful, wonderful stories about missionaries um, uh, and, and their stories, the difficulties they, they faced, and, and, uh, and it's just a wonderful material to expose our children to um, God working on behalf of, of people who are committed to them, to him. Some other things that we have found helpful is on birthdays or at other special occasions, we have special times of prayer, of blessing for our children. And uh, each one of our children, we can always tell, it impacts them in a deep way when mom and dad, the rest of the siblings, take time and they pray for them and pray for specific struggles in their lives at that point in time. Also think about inviting your children to pray during family devotions. Well, however, whatever you do, whether you read a chapter from the Bible, maybe you have some other material that you're going through as, uh, as parents, but it doesn't always have to be the dad that prays. Allow your young children to pray as well. It teaches them on how to pray. In conclusion, you and I will not be able to have family devotions without some effort on our end. It requires effort. It will require uh, commitment. Um, but I trust, based on God's word, that it will be a blessing and we will reap the rewards sometime in the future. There are times when it feels like, is it really worth it? But let's not give up as parents. Let's continue to do it. Let's continue to plant seeds of God, God's truth in the hearts of our uh, children. So I pray that you uh, have been blessed tonight. You have a few ideas. Um, and I just want to encourage each and every one. Teach your children the ways of God. Teach him. Teach him. We are now probably more than ever, although maybe the previous generation said that too, there are so many opportunities, so many things that are wanting to grab our attention. Uh, the, the distractions are very real. And let's take the time to teach our children about the truths of, of God's word. Teach them about a God who cares, who lives, who wants to be involved in our lives. And let's raise a generation that is passionate in serving the Lord. So let's just uh, end with a word of prayer yet. God, I just want to come to you tonight and just thank you for your word. And I thank you for these brief minutes that we had here to just look into your word in, in regards to family devotions, time of worship and prayer and singing together. And Lord, I pray that each and every family that is here, whether new believers, whether those that uh, maybe have all grown children, 
or anything in between, Father, that each family would experience you and that each child would know that you are alive, that you're a good God, that you have a purpose for each of them. Lord, we ask for wisdom and strength and commitment in the hearts of the parents to, uh, to take this yoke, this, this responsibility seriously and to teach their children the ways of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.